Democrats and Republicans are vying for the crucial black vote, but is either party getting it right? The projected number of black voters in the U.S. is expected to reach more than 34 million by November of 2024, according to the Pew Research Center. But a recent poll shows that only 38 percent of young black voters say they are motivated to vote this year. That poll, conducted by the group In Our Own Voice, National Black Women's Reproductive Justice Agenda, also shows 25 percent of young black voters voters have thought about withholding their vote as a form of protest. I spoke to young black voters on the importance of making their voices heard before they head to the polls. Here's what they had to say. The black vote, it represents everything. I think we want so many changes to come. And in order for that to happen, we need to have our voices out there. We need to be advocating for ourselves and for our community. So I think the black vote is very important as well as any minority vote, because when only one group of people vote, it only produces one certain kind of outcome. And that's not what you want in the world and for our society. We can really bring, speak up for issues that um, are not just for white people, but for Hispanic people, LGBTQ, um, woman, I think we, we spearhead um, minority issues. I think that there's a legacy in black America that far too many people, our parents, our grandparents, and our grandparents' parents have fought for in order for us to have this right to cast a ballot. Though you might not agree with the major parties, you still have a duty and an obligation to let your country know what you think and what you want to do. I think that it's imperative for black Americans to stay involved in this process because if you're not at the table, you're being ignored. Black female voices in politics are extremely inspirational. Are Democrats losing black voters? Are Republicans gaining any? And who's getting it right and who's getting it wrong? It's time to wake up, Washington. Joining us now to break it all down, our founder and CEO of Blueprint Strategies, Democratic strategist Antoine C. Wright, and co-founder of Bass Public Affairs, Republican strategist Dina Bass Williams. Dina and Antoine, thank you so much for being here. You know, recent polling shows Democrats struggling more with voters of color. I want to go first to a CBS News poll from late February, February which found Biden's support among black voters down from 87 percent in 2020 to 76 percent this year. And then a USA Today Suffolk University poll in January found Biden with just 63 percent support among black voters. Antoine, why are we seeing this now? And do you think voters of color are fairly represented in public polling? I, I do not. In fact, polling is a snapshot of the time, but it has never defined the time, particularly when it comes to the African seed and the American son and daughter. Look, the election is in November. Polls in January and February, when we do not have a declarative nominee, do not mean much, particularly when you're talking about black voters. Now, does that mean that the Democratic Party and Joe Biden or any other Democrat can take black voters for granted? Absolutely not. We've never been a monolithic constituency group, but we have been always been a very decisive voting bloc. And you can win with us, but you can certainly lose without us. That's why I been saying all around this country that black folks are casting a survivor vote in this election. And what that means is that whoever wins in November is going to have impact on whether or not our communities thrive or survive. We take that responsibility very strongly. That's why I don't think a poll six, seven, eight months out means anything about the intensity of what we feel. So, Dina, now to you on the polling. Do you view the recent surveys showing less enthusiasm for Biden and Democrats as a turning point for black voters? I do see it as a turning point, but I will have to say I agree with Antoine in that um, polling is certainly a snapshot of the of a moment in time. But what we've seen with po with President Biden's polling in the African-American community that as we take these snapshots in time and as we've taken these snapshots in time since 2021, he is hemorrhaging the black vote. And what we also understand is that the Democratic Party cannot win an election without black voters and not and the vote has to be at a 90 percent um, level. You know, the polling is showing everything from President Trump having a 15 to 20 percent favorables among African-Americans, which I mean, it, the fact that we're that's a low number. But for Democrats to lose that that percentage of, of of the black vote, they simply cannot win without it. So I think the thing that's exciting about this is that finally um, the 
both parties will have to pay attention and, and will aggressively court the black vote. Democrats will hopefully not take the black vote for granted. And Republicans can finally see that there's a chance to make a difference and do significant engagement in the African-American community. So speaking of former President Trump, he's been very vocal about what he believes he has done for black Americans. Let's take a listen. Honestly, it should be 100 percent of the black people should vote for Trump because I did more for black people than any president other than Abraham Lincoln. It's true. So to both of you and Antoine, we can start with you. Are those comments from Trump fair? And just what's your general reaction? Not just no, but hell no. Uh, look, <laughs> just because the former president says it does not mean it's true. Uh, in fact, when you think about what he did and some of the things he said regarding black folks, whether it's calling African countries, SO countries, whether it's calling a black female who worked with him, uh, a dog looking into a camera, whether it's saying arrest or fire to SOBs when it comes to black NFL players, a kneeling in uh, in response to police brutality and violence. Look, Donald Trump does not have a stool to stand on. And make no mistake, black folks, no matter how tuned in they are or not so tuned in they may not be, they're never going to cast their vote for a racist, bigotist, uh, someone who spews hate, uh, someone who pledges their allegiance to white nationalism, Christian white nationalism, and all the things Donald Trump stands for and who he stood with. Now, the caveat to that or the key to that is black folks staying home in this upcoming election is just the same as pledging their allegiance to President, former President Trump and Trumpism. And that's why we have to do everything we can as Democrats to motivate and educate folks on what's at stake in this next election. Gina, what's your reaction? Well, my reaction to that is, first of all, I think that it is important for us to recognize that Democrats have used that playbook for I've been in I've been doing this for 40 years. I worked on my first campaign when I was 11 years old. We elected the first black woman to the city council in Columbus, Georgia. She happened to be a Republican. And 40 years ago, Democrats were calling blacks like me um, sellouts and they were calling um Republicans, white Republicans, racist. So now there's a love affair with the old Republican guard, and there's um, and there's a, a hate affair with President Trump. When we look at when we look at racist rhetoric, Joe Biden said that he didn't want his children to go to schools with black kids because it would be a racial jungle. Joe Biden called um, a, a grown man, Congressman Richardson, a boy. These um, he he said that President he called President Obama. Um, clean. This is a, um, a an Ivy League an Ivy League educated man. Why would he not be clean? These same comments from a President Trump, and they're you know joke like I don't I don't condone them on either side, but these same types of comments from a Democrat would they get a um, if those comments came from a Republican, they would not get a pass. We give them a pass for Democrats. So like for forty years. We have seen this. I have seen this page from the Democratic playbook. What I would like to see is results. And so what I'm excited about in this election and in this season is that black Americans, 20 percent of African-Americans look at Donald Trump favorably. Now, let's just look at the media. Let's look at I mean, every other day that he's being accused of some crime, um, he does have a way of not being the most um, politic person in the, in the way he speaks. But even in, even with that, 20 percent of African-Americans view him favorably because of the result. We, we have to recognize that in this season, even though the Biden administration is taking a victory lap around the economy, most Americans, American families are feeling a crunch at the gas pumps and in the grocery store. This victory lap that the Biden administration continues to take, most Americans are looking around thinking, where, like, where are the wins? And so black Americans are feeling that as well. Antoine, I saw you shaking your head a little bit there. Wanted to give you a moment to respond. Well, there's a lot to unpack there. But look, uh, let's just look at what we can see on the surface. We have a black woman who's vice president of the United States, more black women, more black women on our federal courts than all other presidents combined. Uh, black unemployment rate at the lowest has been 
uh, on record. More African-Americans have health insurance than they ever have in the history of this world. Seven billion dollars to eight historical black colleges and universities, including wiping out the debt. We've closed the black racial wealth gap, the most diverse administration in our nation's history. I mean, I can go on and on about the real time, real life accomplishments, real time, real life accomplishments that this president has done. And I will go on record to say he's been the most consequential president in, for black Americans in the history of this country, particularly with the margins he's had in the House and the Senate. Now, has that translated to every single black American in this country? Absolutely not, because for 200 plus years, we've been neglected. So things do not change in four years. But we've made tremendous progress. And it's been Donald Trump and Republicans trying to erode away reproductive freedom. It's been Donald Trump and Republicans trying to take away our rights to vote and our rights to have basic fundamental freedoms that my parents and grandparents fought for. So I think there's a real contrast to be made in this election. Dean, I want to give you a moment to respond. Yeah. This is what I won't do. I'm not going to paint Republicans as saints and Democrats as, as devils, because I believe that there's enough um, uh, there there is enough bad in both. Right. But I'm a Republican and I'm a Republican for some very specific reasons, because I do not use euphemistic terms like reproductive rights. I, I call it what it is. It's abortion. It's exterminating a life. And I think that um, and for me. As a as a woman and as a black woman, when I see most abortion clinics in black neighborhoods, when I see that we represent a third of the population yet 33 percent of the babies aborted, then to me, that's a problem. But I also want to go back to some of the other things that were said. And this is where we as black Americans and as American voters need to not use selective outrage. For instance, we understand that under President Trump, he made Uh, moves to advance support in the HBCU community in ways that had not been done before. We should celebrate him for that. The funding for sickle cell um, uh, uh, research, we should celebrate him for that. Um, Closing uh, the wealth gap under President Trump, we should celebrate him for that. And we are, and in the same way that I, as a Black American, will celebrate President Biden for, for taking those wins and advancing them so we're we're getting better we're moving closer and i and i support that but i'm not going to sit and diminish what president trump did to advance hbcus i I, you know five generations of my family attended historically black colleges and universities so i support that i'm not but so to say that he did nothing and that he destroyed is he is he in politic absolutely is president trump will i invite him to sunday dinner probably not he's not that guy right But to deny the advances that African-Americans gained under his administration is is to me, that is selective outrage and I won't do it. Well, I don't call it selective outrage. I just came here to speak the truth about what Joe Biden has done for black America. And no one can debate. but, 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 But I'm not here to talk about. I'm not here to defend President Trump's lackluster record when it comes to black Americans, particularly when you think about what he's done to erode back the progress. And look, I don't know where I don't know where you may have carved your information from, but I go I travel to black communities all over this country. I don't see abortion clinics on every corner. What I do know is that when it comes to women making their own health care decisions and those decisions remain between her and her doctor, I do note that it's been Donald Trump's right wing activist court that rolled back those protections so much so that a woman born today or a child, a little girl born today will have less rights than her parents and her grandparents about What's said about her body? And truth be told, you can say what you want about how to word it. But when it comes down to it, abortion is health care. We show up at clinics all around this country, thanks to the Affordable Care Act, to get the necessary health care we need from places like Planned Parenthood and others. And it's been Donald Trump and the Republicans trying to roll back the clocks of progress when it comes to the Affordable Care Act. By the way, the Affordable Care Act passed and ushered by former President Obama, the same man who Donald Trump says was not even born as a U.S. citizen in this country. So let's well, just, uh, you know, Dina, I just want to move on because we only have a few a few moments. But if we're going to talk about issues, and Dina, I'll go to you on this first. I mean, what are the top issues that black voters care about from your perspective? I believe that black voters are, are worried about the same thing that all American voters are worried about, the economy. I think that in um uh, when we look at the southern border, I think that uh, Americans are concerned about immigration. I also think that there is a that there's an anxiety about 
global politics that is um, affecting Black Americans and all Americans in ways that we have not seen in generations. So I think that the, the, when you look at who will be able to tackle those issues, who Americans will trust with those issues, that is how you will determine um, who's going to be our next president. But I will also say this, you know, we have a third party candidate in Robert F. Kennedy yeah. that should give Democrats pause. I know that some people say it's going to take away from um, Trump voters as well. But when you have someone like Robert F. Kennedy, a former Democrat who is polling at 13, 14, 15 percent, Joe Biden should be concerned about that because African-Americans are are looking at RFK um, as, as an attractive alternative. So on that you know, topic of political parties, third parties, I want to go to you both on this. Antoine, we can start for you. Do you think both Republicans and Democrats have taken black voters for granted? I do not, because when I look at my party and I look at the progress we've made, and that's how you measure or not whether or not someone's taking anything for granted, we've continued to treat black voters as an investment, not an expense. If you look at our party structure, if you look at the leaders of our party, I think they're very reflective of the American soil as a whole, because the browning of America is happening before our eyes. And if you look at our policy agenda, the things we advocated for, and quite frankly, the things that Republicans have fought against and trying to take away, I'll put Democrats on the winning column any day of the week. Uh, is there work to be done? Absolutely. The biggest room in any house is the room for improvement. But these things, elections are come down to a binary choice. And if you look at what Republicans have done, and what they've not done and what they've advocated against and what they've advocated for, it does not it does not line up or match up, quite frankly, with what black Americans care about and what their priorities are. In fact, I would argue that the things that Republicans say and advocate for when it comes to black Americans is very reflective of the abusive uh, language that we heard in two, in 1964 that we're hearing from them in 2024. Dina, um, do you think they've been taken for uh, granted black voters? I, I do believe that the Democratic Party has long taken the black vote for granted. And I think that evidence of that is that a man as um, controversial as Donald J. Trump is polling at a 20 percent favorable in the black community. I think that Democrats have taken the black vote for granted. And I think evidence of that is the fact that um, a candidate like RFK is polling at a you know 13 percent, and so the results are in uh, will come in November. But for me, like I will not pretend that there is not um, room. Like I, I, unlike Antoine, I'm not going to roll off all this. Um, like, <laughs> have taken blacks for granted, right? Because if if you ask most Black Americans, they will say the reason people are um, sounding off on Joe Biden is because they're tired of Democrats trot, trotting out the importance of black votes every four years, but doing no, nothing of significance for black Americans. So yes, Democrats have taken black votes for granted. And I think finally, Republicans will see that there is an advantage to aggressively pursuing the black vote. Antoine, I want to get your take on you know the fact that many black church leaders have spoken out against President Biden's Israel policy, along with many young black voters, particularly from Generation Z. Do you see this sentiment being echoed across the black community? I think there are some who uh, feel very strongly about this issue. And look, I don't think the president disagrees that when you see uh, children dying, when you see babies hungry, that there should not be something done about it. It does not mean that he's not doing anything to fix the problem. It just may not be happening in the light or at the speed that others want it to. At the end of the day, I'll say to young voters, the not so young, the black, and the not and any other race or demographic or any other constituency, uh, look, the differences you think you may appear to have with President Biden and Vice President Harris do not compare in any way, shape, or form to the differences we have with the other side. When it comes to diversity and inclusion, this president at least will hear you uh, and respect your difference of opinion because we are a diverse party and we respect, we respect diversity of thought. When it comes to the other side, we already know what former President Trump has said to protesters who may not agree with them. Uh, he, he encourages violence. And so I think there's a big difference. I have not heard one Republican position when it comes to Gaza and how to deal with that, other than we do not need to send funding to these places and they're holding up legislation to do for us. So I think, again, a binary choice, Trump and Trumpism, 
Biden and Harris is what the American people will ultimately have to decide upon. So we only have a few minutes left. I want to get both of your takes on this. Dina, um, from a Republican perspective, what does President Trump need to do to win over the black vote? You know, I believe that President Trump needs to continue to um, to shoot from the hip the way he does. I think that that's something that's certainly attractive to um, most Americans, they're tired of the double speak that they get from the left. I think that pointing out the flaws in um, the way the Biden administration have uh, uh, approached this, the issue of the southern border. And I know that a lot of people are saying that um, we should run away from Roe versus Wade and abortion. But I really believe that when you talk, and not I believe, I know this, this is evidence from the conversations that we have had across the country. When you talk to Black Americans about the issue of abortion, there is a clear belief that abortion is wrong. And I'm not going to call it reproductive rights. And so, and I am one of those who for, you know, decades saw Republicans make moves and promises about abortion, but do nothing. And President Trump has done something by appointing justices who will overturn Roe v. Wade. And I think when you when you have real conversations about when life begins, I, I actually believe that Republicans have a bigger uh, voice and more support on that issue if they are not cowards and if they don't run away from it. I am not going to let the left win on determining when, when life is. To me, this is an issue that we dealt with um, literally my entire life. And so I believe that Republicans can win on that issue. But again, it's all, you know, it's always the economy stupid, right? And so Joe Biden can take the victory lap about the economy that he wants to, but as long as families are, are pinched in the grocery store and pinched at the gas station, this victory lap is going to be the, um, the laughing lap that it is. Antoine, Look, I, 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 wel I welcome your thoughts on when it comes to reproductive freedom. <laughs> that you all are pro, uh, you are pro not giving a woman a right to make her own health care decisions. In fact, I would not be surprised if your comments end up in an ad. And if you think that that is a winning message, you obviously have not been paying attention to what has happened since the United States Supreme Court has rolled back. Uh, you know what has happened since that? I'll let you finish. I'll let you, I let you finish. I'll let you finish. I'll let you finish. I'll let you finish. Can I finish my thought? Yes. <laughs> I'll let you finish. Can I finish my thought? Uh, I welcome your version of the truth uh, because what we've seen around the country, like in deep red Alabama, a candidate, Democratic candidate who lost before, ran on reproductive freedom and won the race earlier this week by seven points. We've seen this narrative all around the country, even in deep red Republican states. So we welcome your national abortion ban rhetoric. We welcome all the things you have to say about reproductive freedom. In fact, that is going to push more independent thinkers and more former Republicans towards Joe Biden and Kamala Harris because a woman deserves the right to make her own health care decisions. So Antoine, really quickly, what does President Biden need to do to make sure he turns out the black vote or wins the black vote? Well, one, he has to remind folks of where we've been. Uh, he has to remind them what he's done. He's got to paint a vision for the future. We have to give some real muscle memory to who Donald Trump is, who the Republicans are, and what Trumpism will mean, including Project 2025, if they were to have their chance at power. But we also have to tell people what we're for. And I think Joe, middle class Joe Biden uh, continues to be a middle class American who fights for those values, shared values and issues, continues to punch above his weight and continues to deliver the promises he's made to the American people, in particular for black Americans, whether it's HBCUs, student loans, infrastructure, health care, the economy, promises made, promises kept. I think he just has to amplify that message with non-traditional voices who may not be in the political elected space. Dina Bass-Williams and Antoine Seawright, thank you so much for a very lively discussion. It's great to get Republicans and Democrats on to have these conversations. Thank you both. Thank you. Thank you. The Hill and Howard University recently teamed up for a Black Women in Politics event featuring former Georgia gubernatorial candidate Stacey Abrams and Missouri Representative Cori Bush, who were joined by several other political advocates. Take a look. We have a lot of Black women who are defining politics, who are creating movements within politics, 
who are adjacent to politics, but do we have a lot of black women who actually have decision-making power within politics? The answer is no. So our issue should not be the fact that people cling to identity. It's the fact that we allow identity to distinguish your access to power. And there is no one better to remove the barriers than the person who ran into it. I needed to be at these tables because the leaders who were making the choices and decisions hadn't been exposed to the things that I had been exposed to. I've been um, unhoused. I lived in the car with my two children. I I've worked as a low-wage worker. And I think about where I was and what I needed and how people crafting legislation mm -hmm. thought that they were doing such a good job. But because they had never been through those mm -hmm. struggles, they didn't know what they were stepping over. I grew up in a community I was passionate about that community. I saw what happened to my community when certain people got into power. And I said, if not me, then who? There should be strong intentionality placed on having substantive leaders at the table. It's not just about who's holding the office. It's who's the chief of staff, who's making the phone calls, who's writing the press releases. Because the way we tell our stories often determine how our stories are heard. There's a way in which um, black women participate um, make significant and huge contributions um, to our communities, um, who see themselves as um, leaders. Something is your thing. So tell and letting people know that something is your thing and you can bring that to this movement. We've got to have a both and approach, both state and local and federal. But when we decide to focus on one to the exclusion of the other, the people who are fighting against our advancement are gonna take the power of that other space and use it against us. You owe it to yourself and you deserve to have that representation in every room, at every table, on every side. Because like I said in the beginning, if you're not at the table, you are on the menu. The moderator of that event is The Hill's race and politics reporter and host of the Switch Up podcast, Cheyenne Daniels. She joins us now. Cheyenne, thank you so much for being here with us. And what a great event, particularly on Women's History Month. I was there in person and it was just a fantastic lineup of speakers. Wanted to get your biggest takeaway from the event. Well, Julia, thank you so much for having me. You know, when I look back on the event, I think one of my biggest takeaways that we saw was just the power of Black women at all levels of government, whether they're voters, whether they're running for office, whether they're already elected. Um, you know, despite the barriers that Black women are facing, um, Black women are persevering and they're still working to bring each other up with them as well. You know, um, I think that that was something that was just a beautiful moment to see um, and to see many of the, the students, many of whom were young black women in the audience, see it in that moment, all of the different ways that they could be involved in politics, whether that's on the, the polling side, um, whether that's on the uplifting side, as we saw with Gabrielle Wilder, whether it's running for office, as we saw with Roxy and Kimberly. It was just a wonderful event of, of truly empowering and seeing the power of Black women. You had such a great group of both Republican and Democratic Black women. You know, what was a common theme you noticed in all of your conversations with those in attendance? So it was really important for me and, and for us um, at, at, with The Hill and with our partners at Howard University to highlight just how diverse Black women are, right? The same way that Black voters are not a monolith, Black political leaders are not a monolith. And one thing that we heard in spite of this was that regardless of what party these women identified with was that they all had the same idea of unity in mind. It was about bringing the black community forward, finding the ways that the black community needs to and wants to be heard, the issues that are at the top of their mind and trying to find the way that they can solve those issues so that we have a better country as a whole, not just for um, black Americans, but for our entire uh, society. And that was a really beautiful uh, message to hear from these individuals. You know, it was interesting, Stacey Abrams, discussed changing the process when speaking about greater representation in politics and policymaking. How are we seeing Black female leaders like her changing this process? One thing about Stacey Abrams that is clear is that she is a huge proponent for voting rights. She wholeheartedly believes in ensuring that we all have the right to vote. And so 
for her, when we think about a lot of the work that she's doing when it comes to changing that process, she fully believes in telling those that you have to get to the ballot box to elect the leaders that you want to see, whether that's yourself, your friend, your neighbor, or whomever else, to be able to see the change in the policies. Because if we can't change the policy, Stacey Abrams says, is that we're not able to change that process. So changing the policy has to start with getting to the ballot box and being able to preserve voting rights for everyone. Cheyenne, I spoke with some of the young women that attended your event about the importance of black women in politics. Let's hear what inspires them. Black female voices in politics are extremely inspirational and motivational just because their perspective is just so keen on the issues and really their experiences. I think that it's very important that we are on the front lines and even if we look at having Kamala Harris as our vice president, having someone there to know our experiences and represent us. The importance of using our voice to create policy is exponential, right? We need to be represented in order to get policy that accurately makes positive change in our communities. So Cheyenne, do you hear those same sentiments echoed from women in the black community overall? Absolutely. I think one of the big things that we often hear about when talking with black voters in general, but especially with black women, is that representation does matter. And we heard this come up time and time again at the discussion that we had last week, which was that we can't see changes happening if we don't have people in office who have been through some of the same experiences that we have been, who have faced the same barriers that we have faced, who can relate to us to say, I know what you're going through because I went through that or I saw my mother or my best friend go through that. So I know from personal experience what is needed. Um, and so it's, it's I think what those students were saying is something that is echoed widely around black communities across the nation. So Maryland Councilwoman Roxe Ndebumadu talked about the importance of being community minded. What does this mean for black women? One thing that Roxy said that I think really struck me and many of the, the students in the audience is that to be community minded means you have to have a sense of unity. You have to be able to go into these communities, see yourself, but more than that, you have to be able to say, where don't I see myself? Which is what led to Roxy seeking um, her own campaign and eventually her own election where she is now a council member because she said that she looked at her community, she didn't see herself represented. And that meant that she didn't see any changes that were happening that were impacting her specifically, her community specifically. So being able to take a moment and say, it's not about a party, it's about what do we need? And you know, that's something that we hear consistently, whether that's from um, analysts like Adrienne Shropshire, who was president, um, who's the executive director of Black Pack, to leaders like Gabrielle Wyatt, who's the, the founder of the Highland Project, which, which focuses on, on promoting and empowering Black women, is that we just want to be able to see our Ourselves represented so that we know at the very least there is a voice that represents us sitting at that table. We might not always agree with what they're saying, but we know that our experiences are getting into that room, which means that somehow they are reaching the policymakers. And it's even better if you are one of those policymakers. Absolutely. And, you know, speaking about, you know, some of those figures, Stacey Abrams, one, once again, she was a former state lawmaker. She spoke about the importance of black women being encouraged not only to run for office at the federal level, but also at the state level. Talk about why she put such an emphasis on running for office at not only the state level, but also the local level. You know, we had an interesting moment um, talking with Stacey Abrams. I had mentioned about the strides that we had seen black women make, and I had named names such as Vice President Kamala Harris, Supreme Court Justice Ketanji Brown Jackson, our press secretary of the White House, Corinne Jean-Pierre, um, and, and Senator LaFonza Butler, who's currently the only black female senator serving right now. And uh, it was very interesting because Stacey pointed out that those are all wonderful positions, but there's something very disappointing, something very disheartening that we're able to name those names, that we're able to sit there and tick off on our fingers these four or five individuals who have made this history. Meanwhile, we can't even name one black female governor because our nation has never had one. And so for Stacey, part of what she was saying is that the federal level is really important. It's really amazing when we're able to point to these historical moments, these figures that are making history and breaking glass ceilings. But if we don't have the representation at our state and local levels, then it's hard to get up to that federal level is what Stacey was saying. And so that's why she said that she spent so much of her time and continues to spend so much of her time not only advocating for 
state and local representation, but being involved herself personally, right? We don't, not saying that we'll see Stacey Abrams run again for governor of Georgia, but what she is invested in is making sure that the places where we currently live have somebody there who is familiar with that community, who is familiar with the people who live in that community, and then can take those issues that are important to that community from the state level to the federal level. I've talked to so many sources, you know, particularly on the Democratic side, who have said President Biden would not have won Georgia if it wasn't for Stacey Abrams in her effort there to turn out the black vote and really engage, um, you know, from the grassroots uh, level. So that absolutely um, really seems to ring true. Cheyenne, congratulations on the event once again. And thank you so much for being here with us. Thank you, Julia.